mounts versus rings, carbon wrapped barrels, and more this week on Mail Call Mondays. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Back here on another Monday with a fresh batch of questions for you, so let's get it started. Uh, Penny Bags gives us our first question with mounts versus separate rings and bases. When are mounts better than rings and bases, and vice versa? Thanks. Well, generally, mounts and rings and bases serve the same purpose when you look at the big picture. They're just used to hold your scope in a consistent position above the bore of the scope. Now when you say mounts, there is a really wide variety of devices that that encompasses. Uh, when we say rings and bases, typically we think of our regular uh, either Picatinny scope base or just regular dovetail type base and then rings that mount on top of those. And again, there are a wide variety of different rings and bases. So it really is difficult to run down a this versus that kind of comparison. As a really wide open generality, if we're talking about quick release type stuff, then I prefer to go with a mount. Uh, I really think that a mount, the design overall allows you to get a better consistency with a one-piece type mount than you can with two separate quick-release rings. That's not to say that there aren't quick-release rings that do have a good return to zero. It's just I believe that you really have a more robust part when you're dealing with a quick-release mount. Now, when you're dealing with cross-bolt type mounts, uh, for instance, uh, Badger mounts or uh, Seekins new mount, uh, where they're bolted in, they're not a quick-release, really you, you still have that rigidity. Now then you can also look at things like the Night Force Unimount where that really takes the place of rings and a base but it's all a one piece type deal. Really I, I guess to answer your question as simply as possible if I need a quick release I'm going to look towards a one piece mount. Uh, if I'm mounting something on an AR I generally go with mounts because we're talking about a higher uh, sight height over the rail system so I just really believe that a mount gives me a more rigid uh, mounting setup uh, if I want something that is light easily uh, easy to handle uh, then I'm gonna look more towards a Picatinny base and rings uh, really it comes down to your individual application and the individual rings or mount that you're looking at Franklin asks, to go along with your previous budget builds, what's a good budget spotting scope? Well, Franklin, when, we talk, when we're talking about budget, um, it, you really have to look at things differently. When you're talking about a budget setup, you want to minimize expenditures where they're not really needed and maximize the amount of money that you can put into the key pieces of your shooting setup. Uh, what I prefer to do is instead of trying to split your money between a budget rifle scope and a budget spotting scope, take all that money and put it into the best rifle scope you can afford. In most situations, when you're shooting, you're going to be able to spot through your rifle scope. And generally, a budget rifle scope is going to be higher quality optics than a budget spotting scope. So although you may have a lower magnification range, you may actually be able to resolve better detail through that rifle scope. It's going to depend upon a lot of factors, but that is often what I see. Um, also throw in the fact that if you are shooting by yourself, then it's kind of cumbersome to come off the rifle and then have to try to look through a spotting scope, whereas it's very easy to fire and spot your impacts through the rifle scope itself. Now there are situations, some shooting schools, uh, some competitive situations where you do need a spotting scope because you're going to be behind the line and it just really isn't safe to be on a rifle behind the line. But those are really a whole lot fewer than the average guy that's building a budget rifle to go out and plink at the range. So if you have a specific situation, then what I would suggest you do is 
talk to the other shooters that are in that same situation and find out the scopes that they're using in the different price ranges. I really don't have a whole lot of experience with the budget end of the spotting scopes because most of the budget spotting scopes I've looked through just are a really, really poor uh, example of a spotting scope. Jackson asks, how do wind speed slash BC work into a formula to adjust for wind? I don't really want to buy a ballistic calculator and would like to learn all my adjustments on paper. Well, Jackson, that's really an admirable goal, but the problem that you run into is the calculations for wind drift and bullet drift themselves are very in-depth. You guys have heard me mention time and time again, I don't like rule of thumb. I don't like guesstimating, especially when we're talking about long range precision. If we're trying to get a first shot impact at long range, then there's really no room for guessing. There's really no room for just ballpark estimations. You need to be exact. And to be exact, you have to do some pretty long drawn out calculations. This is where a ballistic calculator really comes in handy. Now, if you can't afford a ballistic calculator, even the couple of bucks it takes for an iPhone or Android or one of your smartphone ballistic calculators, then what I would suggest you do is go to jbmballistics.com and punch in your variables and allow it to output them. The reason that it's very difficult to do it on paper, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult to do it on paper, is you have to take a very wide array of factors into account. The ballistic coefficient, time of flight, lag time, which is the difference between time of flight in the real world and time of flight in a vacuum, the actual time of flight of the projectile from your muzzle to the target, all those things which take in-depth calculations to get themselves. Then you have to take those factors and put them into another in-depth calculation to get your actual drift. In honesty, in the field, by the time you do all those calculations, the environmental effects have changed to the degree to where those calculations are no longer going to be valid. So you're better off to take those calculations, do them on a computer or on a calculator, that's why we have those things, and then punch out a ballistic chart that you can tape to the side of your stock or throw in your data book, and then carry that with you. There are pretty inexpensive solutions out there like the Adept adaptive uh, FDAC, which we will put a link in the description below. If your uh, rifle fits into the ballistic curves that they have available, then that cheap little plastic slide rule that you can keep in your data book will help you out greatly. Uh, it doesn't take any batteries. You don't have to worry about electronics failing. But really, the cheapest, easiest way to go is go to JBM Ballistics and punch out a ballistic table on that tape it to the side of your stock, and be good to go. Sean asks, would you discuss some suitable calibers for the wife to shoot at the range? Well, really, you know your wife better than I do, so I can't really give you a specific recommendation for her, but what I can tell you is there's not a whole lot of difference between choosing a caliber for your wife or choosing a caliber for any other new shooter, be it male or female. You're going to have to take into account how recoil sensitive they are, uh, what their body size are, what kind of uh, weight they're capable of holding up and moving around. You don't want to get a rifle that's too big and bulky for them to move, but you don't want to get one that's so light that it's going to recoil and really kick the snot out of them. Um, if they are very recoil sensitive, start off with a 22 rifle. 22 rifles are just really great for training and for getting new shooters into the sport with very little muzzle blast and very little recoil. Now, when you get beyond the 22s, uh, there are 223s. The AR-15 is a really, really great rifle just as a general purpose rifle. When you put a rifle scope on them, they can be very accurate. They're very low recoil. Depending upon the muzzle device you put on the front of them, uh, they can have very low muzzle blast. If you go so far as to put a suppressor on them, even better. But all those options will give you a really, really good low recoil versatile setup for her. Now, if she's not recoil sensitive and she's able to toss around the same amount of weight that you do, uh, then you can go for something like a 308 
Uh, I recommend a 308 over a 243 or a 260 because again, if we are learning to shoot, we're worried about putting a large amount of rounds down range in order to perfect the skill. We're not necessarily worried about the razor's edge of competition. We're not worried about running with the front runners. We're worried about warning, ah, can't speak. We're worried about learning a skill. And that skill requires repetition. Repetition requires more rounds down range. And you really don't want to build a rifle up for your wife that you're going to have to rebarrel in 2,000 rounds, 3,000 rounds, um, because that just really is going to put an added expense on it, added stress on it. And you're going to start thinking about how many rounds you're shooting in each session. And you don't want to do that. You want to think about honing the skills. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of idea on how to apply it to your wife. Um, the fact that she is a woman doesn't really have a whole lot of effect on it. Uh, moreover, what her personal preferences are and what her personal body type is. And my wife doesn't like pink. My wife doesn't like girly colors like that. But if yours does, get her a gun that speaks to her. Get her one that is in her colors. Get her one that uh, she has had a hand in picking out because it gives her some ownership in that rifle. It gives her some ownership in what she's doing. Darren asks, was wondering what you would recommend for a new drag bag, preferably in multicam that has enough storage for most necessities for the rifle, ammunition, optics, etc. Doing a great job and keep up the great videos and reviews. Well, Darren, we got something that is right up your alley, and it's sitting right here. This is the new Triad Tactical Precision Rifle Carry Case, and it is in multicam, so you must have been reading my mind. Uh, we are finishing up a full review on the Precision Rifle Carry Case, and this really is an excellent setup. Uh, this size right here is the current available one, and it is set up for a... 20 inch AR, 20 inch uh, bolt gun. Uh, there is a larger version that is coming down the pipe and you can check on triadtactical.com to see uh, when that's gonna be available. But this bag has got some really great features. You can use the Precision Rifle Carry Case as a drag bag if you wish, but a lot of the features that are just really not needed on a range case have been eliminated from it. Uh, the nose cone, that's gone. Uh, the extra snap-on flap, that's gone. Uh, it's made of a little bit lighter weight material so that while you can drag it without causing damage to the bag, um, it's not as much bulk to carry around. Uh, the carry handles are centered up so that most rifles will balance out easily. You don't have that nose drag in the ground like you do with a lot of current drag bags out there. And it comes with two really big pockets on here. The rear pocket is big enough that I can put in a 100 round uh, plastic box of ammunition. I can still have room for gloves, you know, towel, uh, data book, all that extra stuff. Um, you could throw binoculars in here if you wish. And it has these nifty little uh, wrap, Velcro wrap tie downs and Powell's webbing inside so that you can move these tie downs wherever you want. Uh, now, it's not a standard PALS grid, so you may find some pouches that will fit, some pouches that don't, but the grid is basically to allow you to move your tie downs wherever you want to put them. Uh, you can get optional straps for it to allow it to work like a backpack if you wish. And there are double zipper pulls on it. The front is the same kind of deal, it's a very large pouch and it has the same Velcro wrap tie downs. Uh, this is large enough that I can put a field tripod and spotting scope in it, Velcro it down, I'm good to go. Some shooting mats will actually fit in here. I haven't tried it yet, but I think the Triad Tactical mat will actually go in here and zip up. And again, you've got room for all kinds of extra stuff. And in the main compartment here, again, we have our webbing, tie downs, and we have a cleaning rod slot in the spine of the case. That's kind of hard for you to see there. Uh, and up here, a muzzle pocket so that your muzzle goes in there and it's protected. You don't have to worry about it poking through the zipper at the front if you're carrying it nose down. Uh, even the sides of the bag where the zipper are have a nice heavy-duty padding in it. And overall, it is a very 
very high quality bag. Uh, it is designed by Triad Tactical and it is sewn here in the USA with US materials. So overall, it is a great bag. On the back, it's nice and clean. There are no pockets, no extra stuff there. And you just have the webbing spots to mount your shoulder straps should you decide to use them. This is really great because it can even be zipped open and laid flat and used for a shooting mat if you desire. Again, we're gonna do a full review on it soon, but if you're looking for a case, uh, this is one that you definitely wanna consider. Now, people will gripe about the cost of the case. It's US made, it's a quality case. Um, they're gonna be expensive. They're in line with other US made offerings right now. You don't really expect somebody to bring out something and just really cut the bottom out of the price. It's gonna be priced in line with what the rest of the cases are on the market. Uh, if that's not your speed, if you really need to save some cash, then something like the Condor drag bag It'll work, it's lower quality, some things will just irritate the crap out of you, the hardware on it is really not all that great, and if you actually start dragging it, you will burn holes in it. Uh, but if you're just dragging it out of the trunk of your car at the range, then the Condor drag bag will work. I prefer things like the Triad Tactical drag bag if you can afford them, if you've already taken care of the other essentials in your shooting because it fills multiple roles. As I said, you can lay it flat, you can use it as a shooting mat if you wish. Uh, it's got a lot of design features that went into it and just really is a high quality bag. I start to appreciate stuff like stitching and the way the webbing's attached and little things like that really make a difference between average gear and high-end gear. So take a look at those two if you want. They're, the market is just flooded with drag bags, but that just came out this year and it is really a high quality bag. Jack asks, John, I'd like to know what you look for in an FFP reticle. They all look similar, some are busier than others, but what do you think we should be looking for in a choice of reticles? Love the show. Well, Jack, what I like in an FFP reticle is, first of all, that the reticle is bold enough that you can actually use the crosshairs at the minimum magnification, but that when it's turned up to its maximum magnification, it's not obscuring the target. Uh, most reticles have those bases covered where you crank them down, you can still see the crosshairs. You won't be able to see all the detail in the reticle just because of one of the drawbacks of the first focal plane reticle. But you at least want to be able to see a definite aiming point and preferably at least the two, uh, the two mil hold marks. Those are nice to be able to see when you're cranked all the way down because then you give an estimation of where you want the, uh, the holds to be in between those. When you crank it up, Obviously, uh, when you have it maxed out on magnification, you want to see all the details in the reticle. And the details that I want to see when that reticle is at full power is, first of all, some kind of numbering system delineating what the vertical marks are. Uh, I also like to see the horizontal marks, um, the horizontal stadia uh, marked, but if they're not, it's not a deal breaker. You're not going to be holding 10 mils of wind generally like you would be holding 10 mils of elevation in a reticle. So as long as I can scan and see the difference between a one mil mark, a half mil mark, a quarter mil mark on the horizontal line, then we're good to go. But on the vertical, I really like to see those numbered at least every two mils. So two, four, six, eight, ten, etc. I also like to see those numbers placed somewhere that if I'm holding half a mil or a full mil off to the side of the target that those numbers do not get in the way. Um, it really is distracting when you end up holding and you actually have the number right over the target. So I want the numbers out to the side where they don't really interfere with anything. Now when I talk about moving the numbers out to the side, the other thing I like to see are wind hold marks. I like to see the little dots like you have in the Vortex EBR2 reticle. Uh, those little wind hold dots are really, really nice to have. You don't have to hold out into dead space. A lot of times in competitions, you're holding for elevation because you have to move rapidly from one target to another. And you also end up holding for wind because you'll have a different wind call for close targets, different wind call for far targets, and the wind changes as you're shooting. So you may have a different wind call from the start to the end of the string. 
So those little wind hold dots are really helpful in getting me to where I need to be. Now you do have reticles like the Horus reticles. Uh, one of the rifle scopes we're using right now is the H59 in it. And the H59 has this really bold grid over the uh, reticle. And I think this bold grid is sometimes a problem because it is really bold and it is really out there and it is a lot of stuff. And while it still works in order to hold for elevation and wind at the same time, uh, you just have a lot of clutter there. The advantage of dots like you have in the EBR2 Vortex reticle is that if you're not really looking for them, if you don't need them, then they kind of fade away. If you're not really focused on looking for the dot that you need for the hold you need, then you don't have to worry about them. So, you know, those are nice features. Um, another reticle that is kind of, it kind of splits the difference between the Vortex EBR2 and something like the Horus is the Bushnell G2 reticle. Uh, that was one that was come up with in cooperation with George Gardner from GA Precision. And it has lighter lines for the wind holds, but there still are lines that come out and hash marks for your wind hold lines as you go down on the bottom of that vertical stadia line. Um, I've had some shooters tell me that they find these very distracting. I've had other shooters say that they really like them. Uh, I'm kind of in the middle. I don't really find them all that distracting, but I prefer the dots. Um, I try new reticles as they come out, but really the key thing that you want is you want a reticle that reads in mills. You don't want some proprietary formula. You don't want to have to go look up on the internet what you need your wind holds to be. You want to just be able to look at a ballistic calculator and say, okay, for a 10 mile an hour wind, I need to hold a full mill. So this is a five mile an hour wind. I'm going to hold a half mill. Look through your reticle. There it is. Drill it. Uh, you don't want to have to think, okay, it's a four mile an hour wind and I'm shooting a 308 at 2600 foot per second. So which of these little dots in my reticle does that correspond to? It just, it starts to get a little confusing. So simple is better, but you still want enough detail to make it useful. So it gives that some consideration. There are a broad range of reticles out there and kind of to dodge licensing fees, every manufacturer seems to come up with their own spin on the mill dot reticle and the wind hold grid. So there are a lot out there, but that's basically what I like to see. I like to see the reticle broken down at least to quarter mil marks on the main horizontal and vertical stadia. I like to see numbers at least every two mils, and I like to see some wind hold features, some kind of dots or lines that allow me to hold for elevation and wind at the same time. Lowe asks, what's your take on carbon fiber barrels? Well, really, the only... I haven't shot any carbon fiber barrels yet. I haven't done any accuracy testing on any carbon fiber barrels yet because the last few generations of them I just kind of put out of my mind as something for lightweight hunters, something that really wasn't in the tactical or high-precision area. Uh, watching Kalen Wojcik's performance at the 2013 Oregon Sniper Challenge with his proof barrel equipped rifle was really something that made me stand up and take notice of these. Now, I've been watching Kalen's posts off and on about proof research barrels and how well they perform, but I still haven't had a chance to actually get my hands on it. Uh, we've talked to proof research. I don't know if we're going to be able to make it happen or not in the future, but I really would like to get one of their barrels in and do some accuracy testing and, of course, some durability testing on them. Uh, they've got some really interesting videos where they have pounded the heck out of one of those barrels, put them back on the rifle, and not have any problems at all. For those of you that are not sure what I'm talking about when I say a carbon fiber barrel, what it is is basically a regular barrel blank that has been turned down through the center and then wrapped with carbon fiber and cured. And the carbon fiber lends an incredible amount of strength, but not too much weight to the barrel. It actually is quite a bit less weight than the steel that was removed to make way for the carbon fiber. So you end up with a very light, very stiff barrel, which is the best of both worlds for a rifle that you have to carry. Um, so we'll, we'll see if we can get some more hands-on with the carbon fiber wrap barrels. But what I've seen so far, at least with the proof research barrels, is very, very interesting. Well, our last question comes from Daniel. Daniel asks, 
Well, I'm wanting to build another precision rifle. I'm stuck between a Remington 700 and 243 with the 26 inch barrel or building an AR-10 and having a company turn me a 26 inch barrel. I haven't seen many 243 wins on the AR-10 platform, but I do notice some 243 WSSM in the AR-15 platform. Why aren't there more guys building AR-10s in 243? If I'm not mistaken, in some circumstances, the 243 hits with more energy at 1,000 yards than your conventional 308. Well, Daniel, I think the key reason that you don't see more AR-10s in 243 comes down to barrel life. The barrel life on a 243 is very short compared to the barrel life on a 308. So it's perfectly capable of building an AR-10 with a 26 inch barrel in 243, but what you're gonna look at is replacing that barrel at least every 2,000 rounds. Um, when you're shooting gas guns, Gas guns tend to favor a faster shooting style where you're letting less time between each shot. This, of course, heats up the barrel quite a bit more. Um, heating the barrel up and blow torching that throat is what leads to 243 barrels dying as quickly as they do. Um, so in a gas gun, that's just going to occur more often. I think this is the key reason why you don't see a whole lot of 243 AR-10s out there or other uh, large frame AR platforms. So if, if really, if that's what you wanna build and you have a specific purpose in doing so, um, I'd go ahead and do it. I would just go ahead and also have them turn me another 243 barrel on standby uh, if the, the whole setup ends up being to your liking because you're probably going to end up replacing that barrel rather quickly. Uh, and this is going to be the case with any overboard cartridge where you have a large case capacity and a small bullet. You're going to end up torching that throat pretty quickly. So this is why you see more uh, 260s and 6.5 Creedmoor uh, ARs then you do 243s and smaller than six millimeter. They are out there. Uh, you can have GA Precision build you a six millimeter uh, AR-10 or DPMS LR-308 or Mega Arms Ma-10 or any of those, uh, but you're gonna replace the barrel probably more often than you would on a bolt gun just because gas guns favor a faster shooting style. So I hope that answers your question on that. And that's the end of our show today. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed the show. If so, make sure you give us a thumbs up and share our videos. Uh, sharing our videos across the internet really helps us out. If you're a subscriber, thank you very much. If not, please subscribe. And until next time, get out and shoot!